Over the course of a long history in Europe, European Jewry developed a variety of responses to persecution. Responses that enabled Jewish communities to survive in a persistently hostile environment, since there was usually no other kind. Sometimes these responses were armed, like the Judean revolt against the Roman Empire during the first century, and the community groups that defended against government-incited pogroms in the Russian Empire during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. But more commonly, Jewish responses were unarmed. And the response that proved most historically useful for survival was compliance, accepting the authorities' requirements in order to avoid harsher sanctions and penalties. If Jews were required to wear badges or distinctive hats, they wore them. If Jews were restricted to living in specific Jewish streets or ghettos, they lived there. If Jews were expelled from their towns and countries, they went elsewhere. However, when compliance proved unsustainable, Jewish communities tried to lessen the effects of the dangers they faced by other means, such as petitions and bribes and protests or to evade them by concealment of identity and flight. But during the Holocaust, European Jewry faced an unprecedented situation, a situation that they would be unable to resolve with their usual historical responses. Previous regimes, however hostile, either did not target every Jew for annihilation, or did not have the resources and organization to implement this goal systematically. But Adolf Hitler and the Nazis fully intended to annihilate all of Europe's Jews, and between 1933 and 1945, they very nearly succeeded, systematically murdering two-thirds of European Jewry and destroying some 1,500 years of Jewish community life and culture. Moreover, as late as mid-1942, most Jews were unaware that their destruction was even being planned, either because they had no concrete knowledge of the death camps and mass murder, or because, unable to believe that such atrocities could take place in the 20th century, they dismissed the information as rumor and propaganda. But despite this, and despite the fact that they were without allies, or support networks, or power, facing poverty, starvation, and disease, responsible for parents and siblings, spouses and children. Throughout the Holocaust, Jews responded to the onslaught against them with resourcefulness and perseverance. This is their story. On January 30, 1933, Adolf Hitler, the leader of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party, was appointed Chancellor of Germany by President Paul von Hindenburg, arguing that Germany would be better off if it were Judenrein, free of Jews. Hitler and the Nazis devised discriminatory policies and restrictive laws designed to force them out of the country, which, by 1939, on the eve of World War II, consisted of Germany, Austria, and parts of Czechoslovakia. During this period, the Reich's Jews were subjected to economic boycott, the loss of civil rights and citizenship, arrest and incarceration in concentration camps, and violence, including the state-organized violence of the November 1938 pogrom that came to be known as Kristallnacht, the Night of Broken Glass. Nevertheless, they responded to their situation in a number of ways. Forcibly segregated from non-Jewish society, they turned to and expanded their own social and cultural organizations. It became so bad, we couldn't go 
into uh, theaters. We couldn't uh, participate in anything that was going on in the cities anymore. And the Jewish um, organization started something they called Kulturverein, which uh, was actually to give jobs to the Jewish um, actors and actresses and the musicians, and at the same time prov uh, provide some entertainment for the Jewish people. And that lasted a while, and somehow we always had the feeling, well, if we can't uh, uh, participate in whatever the Germans do, we'll just go on the way we can. But in the face of increasing persecution, many Jews sought to emigrate from the Reich. Some people emigrated to other West European countries. My father um, was told that he had to be let go because um, of uh, Hitler's and the government's requirements that uh, companies need to get rid of their Jews. Big arguments started because my mother, having been, so to speak, an emigre before and getting away from Poland where anti-Semitism was rampant, uh, did not want to go to Austria where my father wanted to go, still being an Austrian citizen. He was a true blue Austrian, and he said, ah, it'll never happen there. And my mother said, well, it's too close, <clears throat> too close for comfort. Uh, nonetheless, evidently my father won out, <laughs> and we did move to Vienna. In 1934, my mother's youngest brother and his family fled from Germany. He, uh, uh, he and his family lived in Berlin and he had a shoe factory. And uh, he was already persecuted, excuse me, and he felt that the time has come to just get out. And they came to Vienna just with their shirts on their backs. There were, I'd say, a half a dozen incidents before my uh, father finally decided to leave Germany uh, in terms of uh, racial slurs. Uh, he had been accused of uh, seducing a young woman in his uh, father's store. And uh, it was a trumped-up charge, and very fortunately, the young woman who had been persuaded by the um, police to press the charges, uh, when she got on the stand, uh, she refused to accuse him. And that was sort of the last incident. He finally decided uh, he was very lucky to escape that time, that he'd better get out. And so in, uh, I think it was in the summer of 1935, they decided to leave Germany and uh, move to the Netherlands. Uh, my father went back to Germany, I think, six times, uh, each time bringing along either a friend or a relative uh, to Holland. And it became, uh, over a period of about two years, more and more dangerous to really make the trip. Um, but uh, he was convinced that it was the right thing to do. Some gained entrance to countries in Latin America, and some found refuge in Shanghai, China, which by 1938 was partly occupied by Japan. Crystal night, we got, a, the SS came in the morning by five o'clock, knocked at the doors and took me and my nephew to the jail, city jail. We didn't know what's going on and why they did it. And after about one day, we all boarded buses and went to little towns in the area where they picked up more Jewish people, and then they took us to the concentration camp Sachsenhausen, close to Berlin. Well, I stayed in the concentration camp two months, and I got out only because my mother and my folks in my hometown could prove that we will leave Germany in one or two months, they bought tickets to Shanghai. This was the only place in the world 
where you could go without any visa. All you needed was a passport with a J in it. The authorities stamped your passport with a big J, which means Jew. And we left, I got out of the concentration camp in January the 10th, 1939, and we left about two months later for Shanghai. And we packed a big, there's something else I have to mention, a big, what you call now the containers, you know, the big containers, but at this time they had them only made from wood. And we put in all the stuff we could take, furniture which we liked, special things, and we took this with us to Shanghai. But unfortunately, before the freighter with our container got into Shanghai, the war broke out, and they took him to a friendly port to Japan instead to China. Japan was friendly with Germany, so they took our container to Japan and notified us in Shanghai, you have to pay for the freight from Japan to Shanghai. And this is where our last money went. Many also tried to enter Israel, then called Palestine, where immigration was heavily restricted by the British mandate authorities. I had the idea, being a religious Jew, to go to Palestine. Agriculture was an important item in what's today Israel, what was in Palestine. And uh, I knew a lot about it, having lived with it in my young years. And uh, you were able to export machinery from Germany to Palestine. So I lined up milking instruments, the whole machinery that you need to run a dairy farm. And just as I was getting ready to materialize it, they clamped the law down, the Nazis, that nothing can be exported anymore. All anybody could take out of Germany was his personal belongings. Well, I guess I was not enough of an idealist to start as a farm worker or as anything else in a hard-working, difficult country which Palestine was in those days. So Palestine fell by the wayside too. In 19, the end of 1939, I happened to meet a very wonderful young man. The plan was that we would get married and buy two tickets on a ship, which happened to be the last ship that was to leave Czechoslovakia for Palestine. We packed our bags and we took the train to Bratislava. And then we boarded the ship. And the ship was packed with people, with Jewish people trying to escape to get on this last trip out to Palestine. Of course, nobody knew when we were going. We were hoping, well, we'll go tomorrow, we'll go tomorrow. The situation was so bad, the world situation, that in um, about two weeks later, the British had stopped giving permission to have any ships come into into even close to Palestine and to land into Palestine, to Palestine. So the plan was just uh, shattered and everyone on the ship was told to just disembark and to get down. And of course the money was lost, everything was lost, the last chance was lost and we were devastated. One morning I got up and looked out the window and about uh, half a block from the building we lived in, there was a bridge across one of the rivers in Pilsen, and, and I looked second time and I noticed uh, German so soldiers guarding the bridge. So I screamed a little bit and uh, 
my folks came to the window and looked out too and, and said, well, this is it. And that's how they created the, the Czech protectorate. It was pretty clear uh, where this was going. So my parents signed me up for what was called the Youth Aliyah, Aliyat Noir in Hebrew, which uh, took uh, about a year before it developed into something concrete. In the meantime, they sent me to all kinds of camps, Jewish camps, to prepare for a different kind of life. Well, 1940 was the year that uh, we got notified that there's a place for me in one of the transports. And I, I don't quite know how it was organized, but it was an organized illegal transport from Prague to Tel Aviv. It went on a train to, to Vienna, from Vienna to Trieste in northern Italy. It's right on the Yugoslav border, Trieste is. And there we, we uh, embarked on a ship and uh, we stopped in, uh, we made two stops. One, one was in, in uh, Piraeus, which is the, the port for Athens. Second stop, Cyprus. And from there we wound up in, in Palestine. But most people hope to go to the United States, a process complicated by American immigration restrictions and German economic prohibitions. I had gone to, to Berlin to attend a school, but I was there just a very short time, and the school <coughs> that was run by Jewish people was closed. And so uh, I, I did get a job in the dress manufacturing company. And uh, every morning when, you came, when I came to work, they would say, this one was arrested and this one was not there anymore. And it was just terribly scary, frightening, frightening times. And I then started to prepare to go to America. And uh, my parents would say, oh, you go ahead, they say to me and to my brother. And then when you are settled, then we may come. Well, unfortunately, it never came to that. They just, by the time they they, they were ready to come. The, the, uh, there were so many people, and they had to take a number, and that number was somewhere way in the future when they would be called, and they never got out. Why didn't I go to the United States? Because I couldn't. You need an affidavit to get into the United States. I had no close relatives in this country. I had one distant relative second or third cousin of my dad's, to whom I wrote, and who turned me down because his brother and sister were still in Germany, and he felt that he has to bring them out, and he did not want to weaken his affidavit for his brother and sister. So, what to do? How do you get to the United States? I made myself a partner in my dad's business. Changed the records, changed everything. And after a few months of running it that way, I went to the German consul in Frankfurt. And I told him, I want to go to the United States on my way to Santo Domingo and Haiti where I want to visit some friends. And I want to stop over for 10 days in New York to visit a friend there. And on that basis, showing my books as a partner of a business and definitely returning to Germany, he gave me a visa for 10 days, a transit visa. But before he did, he made me sign a declaration that I would not remain in the United States illegally, nor immigrate through another country. In my desperation, I would sign anything, and I did. 
March 1938, Hitler took over Austria. Things changed very rapidly. My parents were also called up to the Gestapo on a regular basis every three months, starting that summer. Each time they went to the Gestapo, they were told that they had to get out within three months out of the country. My father always explained to them that uh, we had an affidavit, and uh, the problem was with our affidavit that um, it wasn't sufficient because there were two minor children, myself and my brother, younger brother. Um, and in order to come to this, to the United States, when you had minor children, there had to be a $3,000 letter of credit uh, put up so that we would not become wards of the state. Then they said to my parents, this is the last time we're gonna give you an extension. You have until April 15th to get out of this country. And so parents came home and said, we were not sure we're gonna make this. And so you and Pete, my younger brother, are going to go on a children's transport to England. And preparations were made. You know, we were signed up. Uh, all of our um, clothing was marked and there was this big trunk waiting in the front hall and whatever for us to be leaving March 1 for England. They wanted us to go to England because my brother was there at least. And if, you know, by some miracle they could get out, they could stop in England, pick us up and take us to America. My father's sister and her husband left Austria in probably already in March of 38, I mean, almost immediately after. Um, my, my uncle had family in New York and they brought him over immediately. He was able to take out everything, his money, his furniture, his whatever. He, he uh, did secure the affidavit for us. It was the, the head of the, um, the owner of Maxwell House Coffee who sponsored at least 200 uh, Austrians to come to this country. But as I told you before, we, there, there was the need for the letter of credit. And my uncle refused to give that, even though he's well able to do it, because he didn't want the government to know how much money he had. So my parents started a frantic round of whatever was possible to see how could we get to the United States. And one of the things that people did in those days was to write to their namesakes in the United States thinking some black sheep might have come to America. <laughs> well, it turned out <laughs> that one did. And he ended up in Kansas City um, and uh, became a pillar of the community, had five children, and one letter came back from the five children, who were by then were older than my mother, and um, tear-stained letters saying we had no idea we had any family left in the world, and uh, what can we do for you? In January, we got a letter from the American consulate that we were to appear on February 24th for a physical exam. That was exactly a week before we were to be shipped off. And the parents took a chance and said, we're gonna go for it. And we went uh, on the 24th for a physical exam 
for a while there, it didn't look so good because, you know, we were all in our little cubicles getting ready for our physical exams. When I heard a terrible scream, it was my mother. Um, it seemed they suddenly realized that my mother had been born, born in Poland and therefore was not on the Austrian or German quota to be let into the United States. My father must have done an unbelievable job of talking to these people because they let her go. And uh, we got our, I mean, we were passed on as far as physical exam was concerned. And we were um, uh, slated to get our selves together, whatever was necessary, and leave um, before the 15th of April. We actually left the 13th of April. In all, between 1933 and 1939, despite the many difficulties, nearly half of Germany's approximately 523,000 Jews and nearly two-thirds of Austria's approximately 192,000 Jews succeeded in leaving the Reich. On September 1, 1939, Germany invaded Poland and World War II began. Within two years, by the summer of 1941, Germany controlled a sizable territory that extended from Norway to Greece and from France into the Western Soviet Union and a sizable Jewish population of more than 9 million men, women, and children. Although Hitler and the Nazis still wanted German-occupied Europe to be free of Jews, immigration was no longer a possibility. And so, they sought other so-called solutions to the Jewish problem. Between 1939 and 1943, in Poland and parts of the Western Soviet Union, they evicted Jews from their homes and forced them into ghettos, where conditions were so harsh that daily life became a constant struggle against death. Between 1941 and 1943, during the invasion and occupation of the Western Soviet Union, an area that included Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Belarus, the Ukraine, and Western Russia, mobile shooting brigades, called Einsatzgruppen, followed behind the invading forces, targeting all of the Jews for mass murder. However, Sometime after the June 1941 invasion of the Soviet Union, even as Polish Jews were dying in ever greater numbers in the ghettos, and Soviet Jews were being murdered methodically by the Einsatzgruppen, and West and Central European Jews were being subjected to increasingly intrusive and harsh restrictions, Adolf Hitler decided to murder all of European Jewry. By spring of 1942, Six death camps were established in Poland to facilitate the genocide. Belzec, Sobibor, Treblinka, Helmno, Majdanek, and Auschwitz-Birkenau, to which the Jews were transported by railroad and where the vast majority were asphyxiated immediately on arrival by some form of poison gas, and most of the remaining few quickly succumbed to brutal treatment and harsh conditions. But even in these dire circumstances, Jews were determined to live. At first, people tried to evade the Germans. Some fled into the Soviet Union ahead of the invaders. In 1939, when I was about five and a half years old, not quite six, the Germans came into our town. They chased all the Jewish people out into the street burn our houses and lined us up in front of a machine gun and to want to shoot us all. Then one of the top commanders came in and said that that's too many people to kill at one time. They dispersed us to, into fields. 
My father was able to hire a man with a wagon to take us to the Russian sector of Poland, which was Bialystok. When we came there, we were living, they gave us quarters and a resort area, which the communists confiscated from the other people. And we lived there for six months. Us included me, my father, my mother, uh, my aunt, I had an aunt and an uncle, and uh, their two children too. And my grandmother was still alive and my, from my mother's side, and also my uh, grandfather and grandmother of my father's side. We lived in, in Poland approximately nine months. In, in June of 1940, the Russians came and loaded us into uh, cattle cars uh, on a train, and they shipped us. We traveled four weeks by train to Siberia. Some people went into hiding. Both grandparents spent much of the time during the war in hiding with us, although uh, they also spent a lot of time uh, finding their own places to hide. Uh, at one time, we had as many as 12, family, 12 members uh, in uh, a chicken coop where we stayed uh, during most of the war. But much of the time, it was just our family, uh, my parents and, and my sister and I together. Uh, for uh, Most of the time, it was difficult to find hiding places, especially hiding places large enough to accommodate everyone. But the, uh, the Dutch uh, underground uh, was very helpful and uh, did provide us with a lot of leads and names and resources. Um, although you also have to recognize that I think my parents were very lucky because they did have money and I think uh, the assets really did help them to survive. Uh, my father, besides the diamonds and the gold also, uh, because of the fabric store, had a lot of silk. And that seemed to be a very prized possession. So whenever somebody went out of their way for us, he would pay them with either diamonds or gold or, or the silk. And uh, I'm not sure people, you know, just for that reason would risk their lives. But uh, I think my parents felt better being able to do something in return. Uh, we did belong to a synagogue in Holland that uh, gave us the information about uh, how we might try to escape from the oppression. oppression. So I think the, uh, the synagogue did give people the option of uh, going underground and uh, following their recommendations, and they were very helpful, although my father, and he himself had made a number of contacts, and the first uh, place where we stayed was really a, um, a Christian friend of his who had a cottage out in the middle of the woods. And uh, he asked him before the invasion if something should ever happen, whether or not he could use the cottage as a retreat. And uh, the man agreed very uh, wholeheartedly that certainly that was available to them. And as soon as the uh, Germans invaded, uh, we did go to his cottage and stayed there for about um, six or seven months until somebody gave away our secret and uh, we were caught. Uh, and it's at that time that uh, my father took advantage of the, uh, of the underground and um, took some of their leads to try to find an alternative place to hide. Then um, an order came that adults and able people, like teenagers, um, they needed to go to the marketplace uh, and the excuse was that it needed to be cleaned up. And so my parents went up there and my older brother and sister did too. And <clears throat> um, Polish people were there um, and they were guarding so no one could run away. And many people were, were beaten and uh, <laughs> My, um, my father knew a lot of um, farmers 
uh, Polish farmers because of the flour mill. Um, they would do business. And um, one farmer recognized my father and, uh, and he said, uh, you don't need, it's, it's not a place for you, you better leave. And he was going to, to lead him through the guard and to let him go home. But he said that his f f family was there too, so he allowed him to gather the members of the family. And, um, <clears throat> and my parents and my other two siblings came home. Um, no sooner did they get home, two Polish young men came. And they said, um, we came to take you back to the marketplace. And my father said, well, we were just released. We were there and we were just released. And they said, well, it was a mistake. You have to come back. And uh, my, my father started to explain and um, try to talk them out of it, but they just wouldn't listen. And uh, so at this time, he, they wanted all of us, including the other two children, including myself. And my mother, she, um, she was stalling. Uh, it was obvious that, that something was going on and something terrible was going on. So she was stalling. She, uh, uh, she, wanted, she said she wanted to take a sweater for me. Uh, I was still little and it was uh, September um, or, or, less, or August, end of August uh, of 1942. And, uh, and they were hurrying her along, and then she, she was looking for the keys to the house, and, uh, and they said, uh, well, hurry up, and you don't need to lock the door. And uh, um, of course, we didn't know exactly at that point what they meant. Um, but finally, we started walking, and uh, uh, my parents noticed that they were not taking us toward the marketplace. And uh, when they were asked where they're taking us, they said, uh, well, you will see pretty soon. And we were just going along and we heard a shot. And, uh, and there were screams and the two men turned around and they said, it's too late, go home. And in the meantime, we heard the screams and we, we saw smoke and uh, it was it was in the air that something horrible was happening. Um, we didn't go back home. We just kept on running out of town uh, and away from town. My my parents somehow were able to think about what they're going to do next, and and they were able to think about the children. And all they wanted is somehow to protect the children, somehow to save the children. Um, the, the, um, there was no way that we could really be safe anywhere. The only chance we had uh, was that um, my father thought that he would go to some of the people uh, in the countryside whom he knew and ask them to help us. Uh, at least the first Again, we didn't know what what was going to happen uh, or how long it's going to be. Um, you just had to go almost step by step, not only day by day, but hour by hour, minute by minute. So we we walked through the field to a um, to a uh, village. Uh, the name of it um, was uh, Konopk. My father took me along. Uh, he wanted to go into the village uh, without the whole family. And uh, my family remained in, in the field and I remember we got we got to this one house. He was this man was um, the head of the village. There were some other other people and the first comment that that uh, there was from those people was um, as Jews, we cannot help you. Um, if you promise to, to convert, then we will try and help you. Um, of course, my father agreed. The rest of the family came. We were divided 
um, among different um, farmers, and uh, each one of us stayed with another family. We were with the farmers a, f a few months. Um, we were a few months until the Germans started to um, liquidate the ghettos in Poland, and uh, we, we ran away. And from uh, then on, we went in complete hiding. Our flour mill was intact, uh, which meant that um, that um, there was some financial uh, source, if not immediate, for the future. Um, there was there was um, my my parents who had lived through the first world war. They had some experiences. So, as far as what kind of shortages there are during the war, etc. So the money that they had, they invested in fabrics, um, and they took it out to a uh, one farmer that they knew. Um, and uh, and when we were hiding, my father would go and get a piece of fabric, and give it to the family so they could, you know, have some help, because the Poles, uh, it was extremely difficult for them too. Some people tried to run away from the roundups and the deportation actions, and even from the labor and death camps. When they took us out this particular day for this deportation, we had to uh, kneel in the front of the house where, where they took us out, and they were bringing also from different hiding places some more of our people. And while we were sitting there, a guard was watching us. And my little sister was sitting just next to my father, and she was really falling apart. She felt, this is it, they're going to kill us, they're going to kill us. And some r point, when the guard was maybe in a one second looking away, my father pushed my little sister, there was a little door to a little alley, pushed her in, a, in and she escaped. And then after we already got up to walk to the main, you know, again, to the marketplace for more, you know, surrounded people, my father escaped in the last moment. And keep in mind that my brother was not at that time. And this was May the 3rd, 1943. My, my brother was still outside of the ghetto. So we knew that he's, he's still alive. So my uh, brother, took my little sister to a farm and he paid some special, you know, money for uh, whatever valuables for her to keep her. And he used to come each week and check on her. In meanwhile, when they killed my brother and my father were in hiding they were hiding on a, also in an attic at a Polish, you know, uh, house, and someone gave him out. They came and they shot my father and my brother. And when the farmer, the lay, the um, the farmer, got the news that he is not alive, they threw her out. When they threw her out, she was by herself in the forest. Anyway, one night, and she was really in a very bad condition. She was all, you know, uh, frostbitten. She knocks in a door, and the farmer lets her in. And as soon as she's in, they hear heavy, very heavy footsteps. So she thought this must be the, uh, the Germans, and this is her end. And this was really her liberation. This was a, um, uh, the fighters. Among this, this group were a few boys from our hometown, but she was able to live with them. And uh, though they left her behind, they couldn't take her along, and told the farmer that they will send each night someone to check on her. And this is the way it was. They came checking on her, and she put her in one of the, her uh, haste, in a haystack, and um, she had all kind of 
uh, you know, medicine, whatever she needed, and she, she was taking care of her. One day, they got the news from the underground that this particular forest will be uh, uh, by the Germans, you know, they will, um, you know, uh, capture. Though the partisans had to leave this particular big forest and went, you know, to another forest. When this time, when they knew that the partisans are gone, they threw her out again. But she was uh, walking miles and miles until she came upon a very big uh, partisan group, which were really uh, already the Russians, what well, they escaped from the Germans' uh, prisons. So she survived with them. So the train poured out after the doors were sealed and uh, we didn't get anything to eat and we didn't get anything to drink for many, many days. They, they had German guards sitting on, on top of each one of these cars with uh, submachine guns. And uh, after a day or two, the conditions in that railroad car were absolutely unspeakable. I mean, we tried to cut some holes into the floor of the railroad car, and we were able to. Somebody had some tools, and we were trying to let ourselves through these holes between the rails and uh, maybe lay there until the train pulled away and possibly escaped. But that didn't go very far because somebody had tried that from a a car behind us, and the Germans had gotten wise to it, and they were just shooting the people right there while they were trying to lay there. So we decided not to get out. And some, working on their own or with non-Jewish groups, organized rescue networks to help people escape. But even those who were unable to evade the Germans were determined to keep going and to keep their communities going. Drawing on the Jewish tradition of self-help, a variety of organizations in the East European ghettos and the West and Central European cities and transit camps made great efforts to sustain the life and welfare of their communities. They established soup kitchens, hospitals, and orphanages. They organized schools and religious observances, sometimes secretly. They arranged cultural events and maintained secret archives. For their part, Jewish individuals struggled desperately to stay fed and fit and to keep their families and dependents fed and fit. Buying, selling and trading, working long hours for a little extra food, and, despite the lack of sanitation, trying to stay as clean as possible. By morning, probably I wash my face splash my face with water. We had water, running water in the kitchen, I remember. Of course, I don't remember how I wash my clothes or, or probably in cold water on the sink. That's all what I could do. And therefore, when I went to camp, I wanted to work in laundry to keep myself clean. My brothers were inducted immediately when the Germans came in. Two different camps, which I don't know what they were, at the time, we found out there were labor camps. And myself, I was the breadbasket at home. My folks couldn't get any work because they were too old to work. They were 45 and 50, and at that time, they didn't want to take them to work. So I'm the one that had to go to work, which I did, and supported the family as much as I could. I worked for the German well, let me call it a company, a shoe company, where they paid me weekly a small amount of money. When I call it a small amount, it's very small. But I worked there mainly to get the uh, pieces of leather that were falling off what we would call the scraps over here. And I had some people that would come up to my house and buy the scraps from us because leather was not available and they were making military shoes. So whenever you cut out soles, you had a corner, and I used to pick them up every night and take them home, they would let me do that. When we uh, went to Swafkov, uh, I immediately was 
uh, felt responsible for my mother's well-being. By now, I was almost 13 years old, and we had no resources. Since I was only 13, I was never even, I was not asked to work uh, on these uh, uh, forced labor battalions. But other people were, and it was still possible to substitute a person who didn't want to go. He would pay me to go for him. And that's how I was earning some money to help out. And I was substituting every single day on different battalions. And I wound up working for the uh, Nazi mayor of this town as an electrician. I was an, actually an electrician's helper. And I wound up working for him. By now, I was working on my own. And uh, we were remodeling his residence. Uh, particularly, what I was doing is they had surface-mounted uh, wires for the electrical uh, uh, current. And he didn't like it, so he wanted it hidden. And uh, the, uh, the mansion that he had chosen for his residence was made of stone. And uh, I was standing on a stepladder with a hammer and chisel and knocking out a groove in the stone so we could then hide the wires, put fresh mortar over it. And I remember beating up my hands and knuckles from this work, but it was, it was hard work. I was working in Feldseidingstelle, that is in German, um, preparation for the war. And they have over there gas masks and plastic, what was very unknown to us. What I did sometimes when I was in ghetto, sometimes I took the plastic. I need to survive. I needed more food than average, than, than let's say I needed enough food like normal person, but I never had it. So what I did with those plastic, I put it around my body and took out of this working place, went where I used to live and sold this. And this lady, she gave me some money for it. not money, food. So I took to, to ghetto. They didn't recognize me that I am Jewish. Therefore, I smuggled things out of the ghetto and in of the ghetto. I went someplace and out of the ghetto and bought provision, like eggs on black market in the store. I bought it and went to ghetto and sold on black market because that's the only way I, we could survive. I was there maybe 17 years old. And we, how I went out, our place where we live, the basement window was going out of the ghetto. And of course, it took very small person to get through the window. So I went, I was looking on the patrol because they were patrolling the streets. I was looking, I saw the policeman went one way, then I knew it, it will take him a few minutes to go back. So I sneak out on the ghetto out of the ghetto and bought the provision and smuggle in, throw away to basement first, and I run in back, close up the window, and, and uh, that's the way I and my little sister had survived physically. I didn't work because there was no work for young girls at that time in the ghetto. So, uh, it wasn't too much longer. My brother was nine years old, and he went to work for the Germans in a German hospital. 
and he was a very strong boy, and he, he's a very good worker. So he, they liked him very much, and they gave him some bread and some a little some other groceries that he brought home for us. One day, he comes home after quite a few weeks with a German in uniform. So the neighbors were scared that they're gonna take us out and they're gonna shoot us too. So I said to him, of course, in my language, in Jewish, why, why did you come with him? He said, you gonna go to, he told that German likes him very much. And he told him that he has a sister, that she knows everything, which I did, it wasn't true. Of course, he played on his sympathy. And she's beautiful and she know how to do this and she know how to do that. So he persuaded this German to come and take me out to the same place where he worked because they knew over there that the same night is gonna be an Aussiedlung, which means they're gonna take people out and then they close down the ghetto. So they, he took me to work over there and the same night from, from we were in, in fenced in from the fences, we saw hundreds and hundreds and people marching through. I saw my mother and I saw my two sisters. They, was, they were walking them to the trains and they took him to Treblinka, which was a death camp. Conditions in the labor and death camps were even more brutal and fraught with terror. But here, too, people remained determined to survive. One time, what I remember, they have the German shepherds, you know, the big dogs. Mm -hmm. They give the, the dog eat, a soup, a, a big thing to eat. He left, and I finished this. Mm -hmm. So, oh, this helped me so much. I said, this dog's food, so hungry, I finished the soup from the dog left. Constantly hungry. I mean, lost 30 pounds within four weeks. It's absolutely zero food. I mean, food, we were garbage what looked good if we could find it. We always volunteered for work detail to get out to to try to work close to the garbage dump to see if we could get some potato peels or whatever to try to, to survive. It was constant pain, hunger pain, and the weakness. And some of my friends and cousins, which was a huge support system, which is really responsible for all of us to, to be alive because we really sort of took care of each other. You couldn't survive as a single person. Usually you would team up with someone. Uh, it was easier to survive for two people uh, who bonded with each other as, as friends. And my friend uh, that I bonded with, he survived. He and I were doing most of the things together. and. Uh, in uh, one particular camp uh, called Bad Varnbrum, we were uh, privileged to work in the kitchen after hours peeling potatoes for the SS. And that was a big privilege already because if you were around food, there was always the possibility of stealing something it so happened that in this particular camp, the, uh, we had an outbreak of typhus and many prisoners were dying. And uh, the, uh, the uh, cook and his two assistants died of typhus. And uh, all of a sudden, my friend, and I became the cooks in this particular camp. But for some reason in this camp, they had given us meal cards and that had uh, 
every day around the meal card there was, you know, the date. And, and as you went through to get your soup, they punched a hole in your meal card. Since uh, my friend and I were working in the kitchen, obviously, we didn't need the meal cards ourselves. So we had, he had a brother that was in the same camp. So he gave his card to his brother. And I gave my card to another man who was uh, a tailor and he would help us, you know, like he would wash out our uniform because when we worked in the kitchen, we had some privileges that most people didn't have. So when they had two cards, they could go through the line twice and get an extra meal. My sister Matilda, she was very depressed and she was not eating enough. And I was working in the shoe commando and I was having an extra piece of bread. And then I was a friserka. Friserka means a beauty operator. Uh, and I used to go and the, the, the German, there was a lot of Germans, prisoners over there, non-Jewish. And Ukrainian, non-Jewish, Russian. They used to get packages from their own country. And I used to go, and they used to call me to go to, to cut their hair, to fix their hair nice, and they used to give me a piece of extra bread, or their cookie, whatever it is. And then there was a block spare in the evening. After I come from work, I used to go and do those, to give me a piece of bread extra. And, uh, and then in the night, eight o'clock or nine o'clock is a block spare. Block spare is curfew. And I used to, I, I never walk, I used to do like the snake walks, you know, the ground. And I used to bring for a piece of bread so I can give to my sister because she was so depressed. And she don't make it. And I used to work, and my sister, the one is in Israel, she used to work. But the other one, Matilda, she never worked. She was so depressed, she didn't have the energy, she was skin and bone. So one time they made a big selection, they took her. She escaped. The second time, she can escape. There was a big selection. Selection means, you know, it's, uh, if they see a little uh, bruise, if they see a little uh, scratch on your body, you're not good enough for work. You are good enough to go to crematorium. And if you, the bones, they see you, the bones come out from your skin, you are entitled to go to crematorium. So that's what happened to my sister. We used to bite our lips so our lips would look red. We would bite them. And we would pinch the cheeks so they would be looking red so we wouldn't look sick to them. If we look sick, they take you right away to the crematorium. We were drowning in a sea of death, writes Frank Stiefel, a survivor of Treblinka, and I wanted to steer away from it towards some shore of salvation. Throughout the Holocaust, Jews also responded to their situation with force of arms. In the face of overwhelming odds, they organized armed resistance in the ghettos, the concentration camps, and even in the death camps and they formed Jewish partisan units in the East European forests and the West European towns and cities. And although they were a small minority, the fact that they existed at all is remarkable. Marek Edelman, a leader of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, described it this way. In the Jewish combat organization, there were only 220 of us left. Can you even call that an uprising? The majority of us favored an uprising. Humanity had agreed that dying with arms was more beautiful than without arms. Therefore, we followed this consensus. All it was about, finally, was that we not just let them slaughter us when our turn came. It was only a choice as to the manner of dying.
The magnitude of the Holocaust was such that victim responses alone could not have stopped the Germans from implementing genocide. However, this should not keep us from recognizing that the victims did respond and that their responses were persistent and assertive, even if, in the end, almost everyone was murdered. In the words of Holocaust survivor and Nobel laureate Primel Levy, on the morning of February 21st, we learned that on the following day, the Jews would be leaving. All the Jews, without exception. Even the children, even the old, even the ill. Our destination? Nobody knew. The mother stayed up to prepare the food for the journey with tender care and washed their children and packed the luggage. And at dawn, the barbed wire was full of the children's washing hung out in the wind to dry. Nor did they forget the diapers, the toys, the cushions, and the hundred other small things which mothers remember and which children always need. Would you not do the same? If you and your child were going to be killed tomorrow, would you not give him to eat today?